guys, stand over here if you need to. If you need, I have to go in front of the microphone. I've got microphones everywhere. Just stand over here. Okay, I'll just stand over here. SWA flood mapping. Um, for anyone who really doesn't know who SWA is, it's the social social well-being agency here in New Zealand. It's really small. Um, I don't even think it's in English, but um, this is a project about something, uh, some of the work that I did when I was with Dragonfly Data Science um, and the work we did on behalf of SWA. Um, before I get started, what I really want to I, I really want to introduce Sadvi. Um, Sadvi is sitting back here in the corner. Would you please raise your hand for everyone to see? Um, when it comes to the really heavy technical questions on the satellite imagery processing, I'm going to direct you to Sadvi. Um, she did a lot of that heavy lifting and she deserves a lot of the credit. I'm just up here, I think, presenting because I just put my hand up for her. How do I change slides? Uh, the green button. The green button. About that one. Okay, so what are we going to cover? Um, well, first of all, what was the project? So, post -cy cyclone Gabrielle, there was a lot of um, clamor about gathering data and who was affected and how things were affected and how are we going to map it, and everyone was running around. And the social well being agency came to us and said, okay, you have some capabilities and you have some skills around satellite imagery and extracting um, various data out of satellite imagery. Is it possible for you to take those skills and take those abilities and match those to stats NZ data? Because what they wanted to figure out was if there was a flooded region, they wanted to get an indication of the demographics of the people that were affected by the flooded region. Uh, the second thing that was probably most important in this is they wanted to do it really fast. Um, there was, it was really, they, they wanted to be able to get a project up and running and they wanted to know who was really affected. Um, we didn't really look at roads, we didn't really look at anything else. We only looked at stats NZ data and how that uh, interacted with the flooded areas. So really that's what this project was about is how could we quickly take satellite imagery, convert that into something that indicates where a region might have flooded, and then if we could find that region, how does that data interact with the stats and NZ data, um, and can we pull the demographics out of it? Uh, this presentation itself, it'll talk about the task, it'll talk about the planning that we actually did so we could do this really, really fast and we could do it in a repeatable manner. Um, I'm gonna give you an indication of the stack. I'm not gonna get very deep into the stack itself, but I love talking about these things, so if you wanna grab me afterwards, um, let's just hang out for hours, because I will talk about that forever. And the outcomes. Um, I think we had some really good outcomes in this, and I think one of the biggest outcomes that we had on it is we did a really good project, but we really started to build a stack that could start predicting where an event might occur in the future. And um, the way we had it set up, I think we could actually do this quite quickly um, over and over and over again um, based on cloud processing and everything else. So the task at hand, um, I did kind of explain the task at hand already, but it was basically find those regions um, post Cyclone Gabrielle that may have been flooded and then um, how does that interact with the stats NZ data itself. Um, the goal of itself, it had to be timely in the sense that we had to do this in less than a week. Um, we were under a lot of pressure from SWA because they had mandates um, to figure this stuff out, so they were giving us deadlines. We had about one to two weeks, but we needed to get a proof of concept up in about three days. Um, we needed a weighted score uh, based on this. So if you had a flooded region and you had uh, the stats NZ data, um, the, those statistics and some outside uh, parameters that we wanted, we wanted to create a weighted score so that if you looked at the data, you could just get a number that said, we'll say 10,000, and that 10,000 represented potentially that this area was more affected based on the demography of the area and based on distance from certain things and all sorts of stuff. Um, 
So we had a statistical model that we had to build into it as, as well. We also had to make sure that we had this in a CI CD development process. That was really important for this project because what we were doing is that we, were, we had three teams, they were working together, we had three stacks working together, but every time we did a push to GitHub, that push to GitHub would trigger something that completed the process and we were able to continue development but also be delivering products back to SWA so they could QA, QC on those products and they could look back to us and say, well, actually fix this. And we might have already had that change working so we, had, we would hit push. So we had this continuous integrated <coughs> development that we were running that, yeah, if we made a change, things were going up, but we were also working on making the changes at exactly the same time. So we thought that was a really good way to actually make sure that we got this rapid turnaround on the product itself. Um, and then we were looking, uh, what I didn't really mention, but the final product was really gonna be an online um, tool that somebody could click on and get information back of it. We were looking at potential offline implementation of this as well. Um, SWA was talking to us, well, what would happen is if, if we wanted to take this into a disaster zone and we couldn't get internet access, but we're building a web um, application. We did take this into consideration, but um, due to time constraints and um, a number of, I am sure about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's quite all right. Um, so, so we, we, we had the potential, we had a potential for the uh, offline implementation. We had um, the research built on it. Um, the way we developed the stack for the, on, um, for the online delivery and the tile creation, um, we just never implemented it because we really didn't have the resources at the time. And then SWA was kind of saying, oh, yeah, well, it, it's not really that important. Planning method itself, we broke this into three teams. Essentially, we broke it into three stacks. And when I say teams, um, these were really small. Sometimes it was just me. Sometimes it was just Sadvi. Sometimes it was just maybe one or two other people. But I like to make a team a little bigger um, than where we did it. So we broke this into the satellite processing, which Sadvi handled. Um, we had the waiting, which was a, st a statistical person that was working at um, Dragonfly Data Science at the time. He's a really good modeler. Um, and he uh, came up with his own waiting method on it. And then we had the visualization tools themselves. No one worked independent of each other, but nobody um, uh, worked on, uh, no, nobody worked independent of each other. We all did kind of work together, but sometimes we did have our own independent bits themselves. So we had that broken in three parts. We were all connected by a single GitHub repo, which was really, really important. Um, because then we could be checking each other's work and we could be pulling each other's work down. We were also connected by the stacks that we built. So the, um, one process flowed into another that flowed into another and we had this whole continuous uh, system based off of Docker and make files and everything. And eventually the project was just set up where you could just say make project something and then it would just run code. Um, the stack, the stack itself, um, to me, uh, I, I, I like talking about these stacks. I like getting down into these things. I will promise not to try and spend too much time on this, but I think it was quite important because this is an open source geospatial conference. Um, and it's, I think it's really important to demonstrate that we did this all just with open tools. And a lot, um, some of them weren't even geospatial tools. A, a lot of them were just tools that interact with geospatial stuff. So. so for all the satellite imagery processing, um, we initially started with Google Earth Engine. The reason we started with Google Earth Engine is Sadvi knows it really, really well, and we could get really easy pre-cleaned access to Sentinel-1 and 2. Um, we did have an eye on Snap Tools. Uh, is anyone familiar with Snap Tools? Yeah, Snap is kind of the European Space Agency's tool for processing uh, satellite data, Sentinel-1 and 2, and doing pre-processing -pro on it. Um, we didn't really have time to implement it on this project and Sabi was really quick with the GEE, so we decided to stick with that as well. Also, um, the data access, we didn't really feel like setting up a whole pipeline API access to the Sentinel when we could just run it through um, GEE. From there, uh, we used GDAL. Um, I'm sure most people in this room are familiar with GDAL. Um, we just use GDAL as our workhorse for standard geospatial everything when it comes to raster data. Uh, it handles everything super well. It's really efficient. Um, it's really well sourced and resourced. And we did all that. The waiting process itself um, was a post-gis. Uh, 
we, we just chucked everything in the post disks. Um, we did have some issues with it, but I will say that the waiting method worked just fine with that. Um, unfortunately, that was our slowest process, and PostGIS is supposed to be our, our fat, uh, one of our fastest vector processing tools, but um, for anyone who's worked with PostGIS in the past, it's really difficult um, in handling too many vertices, and that was kind of the issue that we were facing. But anyhow, PostGIS was in the process, and it worked really well. Um, GeoPandas was another one of these um, uh, setups that we used. Most of what we were doing, most of the processes we were running, they were all controlled by Python um, and GeoPandas. If you, I'm sure most people are familiar with GeoPandas. Yeah, um, Ge GeoPandas was just the really good way of handling uh, vector data and disassembling vector data and reassembling vector data and adding attributes and everything else and keeping the stack running when it came to the vector data itself. Um, some of the non-geospatial stuff, but really the what we saw as the most important parts of the stack that make this repeatable, make this fast, um, and make it quite easy to run. Python, um, I wasn't a Python co convert until about five years ago, and now I, all I do is talk about Python. But um, Python is really, really good in geospatial these days. Um, Dragonfly, when I worked there, um, I started working with this method that they had. Um, it's this Docker make method that they have where everything is run through a Docker and then everything is controlled by a make file. Um, I would love to talk to anyone who wants to know more about that. I, I'm, I'm a really big fan of the process that they build on this. It is so easy to deploy onto AWS and just pull your Docker onto an EC2 and just have a single make file command that actually runs in sets up everything. Uh, the web mapping itself, uh, it's n I, I don't have a tool name in there, but I had to actually on the fly develop the raster tiler for the base maps. And um, I had to mess around with something called T-Rex, which was uh, how we handled the vector tiles themselves. Um, and then um, we just built everything around OpenLayer 6. But to be honest, OpenLayer 6 was only a really small part of the website. Um, OpenLayer 6 was just for the map um, portion of it. The reason we went with OpenLayer 6 is it really handles custom projections. Um, and I'm a huge fan of custom projections and web mapping. Um, so we actually went with that tool. I, I, I know Leaflet does it, but OpenLayer 6 seems to be really, really well. Um, if you want to know more why we stuck with the NZTM projection for the map product, I, I can go into more of that later. But basically, this was disaster response. We were thinking about uh, potentially people building on top of this and needing like accurate distances on things. So we decided to work in the NZTM projection as much as we possibly could. Um, the process itself, I probably wasted, burned all my time on the tools, but the process itself. Um, we initially started working with Sentinel-1 um, because New Zealand is notoriously cloudy and we figured that Sentinel-1 was going to be our best option to get us started. Um, we found that there were some difficulties in Sentinel-1, so we flipped to Sentinel-2. Um, and for Sentinel-2, we started doing, um, initially just looking to where floodwaters were. And we did multiple passes on this and what we found almost immediately is that floodwaters rise quickly and they recede quickly. So it's really hard to figure out where a flood is happening unless you have a satellite image at that moment. So Sadvi in her infinite wisdom decided instead of looking for flood water, we were going to start looking for the signature of sedimentation. And that was the really big ch game changer for us. And then we could start filtering on that sedimentation um, algorithm. So, oh, I thought you were telling me time. Okay. Um, so we were working with Sentinel-2, uh, we were doing multiple passes, and this is where the CI-CD comes into play. We did a pass, we put that up, and while SWA was reviewing everything for, you, for us, um, Sabi was working on the next refinement of the Sentinel-2 data. From that, we did a vectorization of all the, flood, um, the flooded areas that we had. This is why we had so many vertices, because you would have these tiny little areas with these odd shapes and they would make all these vertices, but that's for a different discussion. We, we vectorized all the data that we had. From the vectorization of the data, we did an intersection with the stats and NZ data itself. Um, really simple spatial relationship. 
uh, but we kept, we tried to keep every step as simple as possible because again, we're under a time constraint and we need to get something up quick and we need to get something out fast. Um, from that intersection, we, all, we did the waiting. Um, basically, we were passing the geo packages off to the waiting person and the waiting person was um, looking at those in post just and doing the waiting. Um, and here is where I think it starts to get interesting. From the waiting, um, we would hit a button and the data would go out to geo package. So we could do QA, QC on the data, but at the exact same time, the data is going into vector tiles as well. So as the data is going into vector tiles, it's going now into a static um, S3 repository of vector tiles. And then we have a trigger um, on the back end that is actually shutting down the CDN um, and then restarting the CDN with the new data in it every time we make a change on it. So what that means, uh, there's a lot of technical jargon there, but what that means is every time we made a change, um, we were looking at about 20 minutes till the live data went back up online again and it was the new data itself. Um, we had a lot of, um, in order to get that to happen, we had to make sure that there was a, the data remained intact. So we always had the same exact same um, headers in the geo packages, and we always had um, the same structure on the data. Then that way, we knew that when we pushed the data out in the automation, uh, and it went to vector tiles, that the website could actually read the data that was coming up on it. Um, we didn't do outputs to geotiffs. The reason I put there, um, uh, the geotiffs and the cogs is that we did have to build a tiler and we did have to build a base map um, that ran this project. And we couldn't find anything in NZTM that was worth using, so we just decided to build our own. So the geotiffs themselves, um, we had kind of had a separate stack sitting on the side. This was what we considered slow moving data. The base maps didn't really change that much. We didn't expect them to change that much. But what we did expect is that we were going to find problems and we were going to try and refine that issue. So um, the triggers on the base maps themselves, we had the same triggers where things would update when they were going, but the base maps themselves didn't really change. Uh, outcomes themselves. Um, I was really happy with the outcome of this project. Um, the team that everyone that worked together, we. We all just kind of clicked. We saw the importance and the need of this. Um, we felt a duty back to New Zealand that it, um, if a government agency is asking for us to do something post-disaster that we were going to do our absolute best and we were going to QA and QC the data as much as possible. The real outcomes on it is that we had a data within three days that we could turn, we turned around back to SWA and said, what do you think of this? Um, can we develop off of this? And that beta, I'd, I'd like to say that we developed everything within three days, but um, really that three days was we just pilfered a bunch of different projects and a bunch of different methods that we were doing. And we just chucked that all into a GitHub repo and we just refined everything down to figure out what we were doing. Um, and then we had a uh, project. We had a project public live with data we were confident with within one week. I really attribute this again to the stacks that we had built because um, we did have to put in some overtime and we did have to work awfully hard, but the stacks that we built, every time we were making changes, changes were going up. We were getting continuous feedback on it. SWA was working overtime hours with us themselves, so we would just um, send a little Slack message to SWA and say, hey, can you look at this? And they would say, yes, can you make this change? And like I said, we had this um, CI CD stack that was actually running that we were constantly making changes and constantly making things going up. So this was a really well-oiled machine on how things were going. Um, we had s automated triggers built into the point cloud. And I, I, that, that might not seem like, oh, one minute, okay. Automated triggers, we made a change, um, things changed. Um, and we didn't have to really think about it. There were no more make this, make this, make this, make this, but suddenly it was just when you had something run in, change was made. Um, we ran everything through production and staging. I don't think that was really um, part of the disaster response and stuff, but that was a really great buffer between um, we were, uh, there was a really great buffer between um, putting something out in the public that could be seen as a major mistake and production itself, but we also had automated triggers for that. 
Um, we did have the scope for online use. We never implemented it, but um, it still exists. We did have scoping for SNAP, um, and we started to implement that post-project because what we noticed when we built this project is that with some refinement, we have we had this really good feeling that this could be more of a disaster preparedness tool. Um, we have this really great stack. You make the changes. You watch things happen very, very quickly. Um, and what we're finding is post-disaster or pre-disaster, we can probably have something set up within just a few days to actually make something happen. And that's me. <laughs> Sadi. And apologize for the, the website URL. W there was a major problem, um, so we had to use the CDN URL to make that happen. If you can remember that, it takes you to the Cyclone Gabrielle impact map. But, or just type in Cyclone Gabrielle map and you'll find it. Thank you, Ian. That's really impressive and fantastic. And um, I've certainly, for my whole DevOps practice, really need to make and document Uh, that's probably more of a question for Sadi. Um, I'm always a big fan of starting from source and building the product uh, from source um, if we have that in place. You know, let's have a talk later. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Oh, there we are. Um, in the context of using uh, satellite imagery for that, obviously it's a little dependent on the. Uh, what you've got available to you, um, but was, did you have a look at um, integrating like uh, hyperspectral uh, satellite imagery for that kind of thing, if, if it's available to you at the time or post, or in just in other situations where flooding might occur? Um, and I don't know, is that s likely to be useful for uh, flood mapping, considering there's like, you can get like eight, eight band satellite pretty res readily if you're prepared for it. Obviously you can't prepare for floods, but is that something that's of relevance to you? So I, w I, I direct you to Sadi on that question. Um, but w what I can answer is that when we set up the project and we looked to run the project, um, it was any port in the storm. So whatever data was available to us is, was the data we were going to use. Um, Sentinel-1 and 2 is usually the most easily accessed. Um, it has its limitations. Um, but um, Sadi is really good at understanding what those li limitations are. So we did a really... Um, analysis going back, yeah, we, we, we would probably look at, when I say we, Sadi, we'll probably look at any, I, I'm not with Dragonfly anymore, so. Right. So, so I think Sadi has a microphone, is that right? Can I yeah. answer? Yeah, I mean, um, during the disaster itself, I want to, I think we want to be, depending on the uh, disaster, I think, for example, if you're looking at floods, I think we want to look at uh, PSAR data, because um, that's going to look through clouds and you'll be able to map the extents. Um, easily, but it's again going to be depending on what kind of data you're going to be using. Um, but if it's Sentinel One, you got to have to have it. You know, you got to be lucky to have that passing over you. You know, wherever it's occurring. Um, barring that, you need uh, data from like Capella or Ice. Um, have like some sort of an arrangement um, to have that data sourced um, post disaster. So yeah. Yeah, with Cyclone Gabriel, I think we were just lucky that uh, there was a Sentinel-1 pass over, yeah, to be able to map. Just right at that moment. Yeah. Um, I'm, we're we're going to go, I'm going to plug my presentation tomorrow. Um, the stack that I built to make the map tiler, I'm going to present on that tomorrow. So if anyone's actually keen on seeing how that stack got built. What time is that on for you? Oh, I think it's lunchtime of all times. So everyone's going to be hungry. Hopefully just before lunch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One question here. Yeah. Last question. Hi, good afternoon. Um, you had mentioned that you had some issues with uh, PostGIS being slow and yeah. the vertices. Like, I'm always curious when people have a slow PostGIS, like what amount of vertices were causing problems? Like what 
called degraded geometries. Well, if, if you look down into it, and it's a notorious problem, um, there were issues um, in broken geometries. Um, anytime you create a new piece of data um, from something like remote sensing, you're bound to get broken geometries. And um, I know PostGIS at times sometimes gets really confused by those and slows that down. But the, the number of vertices themselves, um, we, event, we, we, we did get around that by using something called SP split. Um, we also looked at doing something um, of tiling. The vector data itself we found in the past was that tiling the vector data actually helps. Um, there's a bunch of ways around it. Um, to be honest, like I didn't look too deeply into where the true issues were. We just kind of, when we got happy about the thing, we just hit go and let it run overnight and then we came back around. But there were ways to optimize it, but we can talk more if you want to talk about optimization that way. All right, I'm going to wrap it up there, but thank you very much.